Hey everyone, welcome back! We're here! And I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and holidays and enjoyed your time. Today, we're gonna be looking at some huge upgrades for Sevagoth's Shadow. Last time, I showcased a simple two-forma build for Sevagoth that lets you kill everything with minimal investment. This video is instead for those interested in actually playing a Shadow and is intended to scale up to 2 hour steel path. Because the previous Sevagoth video was self-contained, we're actually able to run the same setup on our normal mode today. It was an ability nuke build that can easily charge our death well to activate our shadow. The only difference though would be moving pillage over gloom instead since, well, this time we're actually using his shadow. That setup is simple, having 328 strength, cast pillage, cast sow, cast reap. This is what the normal build looks like, assuming Matarai Sling Strength and 2 Strength Shards so that we can hit 328 with Molt Augmented. Because today's video is focusing on his Shadow's mechanics, I will instead redirect you to my recent Sebagoth video if you're more interested in all the underlying mechanics of this normal mode build. This means that no, you do not need to use my exact normal mode build and in fact you can just use whatever you want since we're not reliant on specific helmets or setups on normal mode today. Just remember that the death well can only be built on enemies hit by so from normal mode or death's harvest from shadow mode and that you cannot rebuild death well while in shadow mode. Let's dive right in. Sevagoth's shadow is rather unique because unlike most exalted weapons it is a full transformation ability that literally spawns a second playable entity. It is similar in this aspect to Titania's Razor Wing, except your normal mode remains active on the battlefield even when in shadow. All abilities active on normal mode will also remain active. The shadow has its own set of four abilities, well, three, because the fourth is just returning to normal mode. Our first ability is the most important, but we will not be fully reliant on it. It's a grouping ability in Ragdoll's enemies with lifted status, however the lifted is kinda useless because of how lifted mechanics work, so don't bother trying to build around this, it's just a simple grouping tool. Consume is our lifesteal, healing based off of damage dealt, and this is also the ability you spam when you activate Sevagoth's death tomb when he dies. Spawning a shadow instead, when in the down states, consume instead becomes a true damage instant one-shot ability with no energy cost. Landing 5 kills with it will fully revive Sebagoth, and our third ability, Death's Harvest, is just a massive AoE damage vulnerability debuff. The field does not linger or follow us around like Gloom, and rather, any enemy caught within the initial AoE will have a duration based debuff. The Shadow Claws are his exalted weapon that have massive slash weights. More importantly, the neutral combo has about 40% of its total damage output, as Force Proc Slash and Heavy Attacks are entirely Force Proc Slash with a 1600% massive multiplier. This results in big damage when you remember that the claw damage scales multiplicative with strength before base damage applies as a separate stat. This is where today's interesting tech comes in, melee arcanes from your normal melee weapon carry over to shadow claws. Unique weapon traits also carry over from your melee, as well as taxiing onto melee influence also. This results in claws being able to proc Amalgam Arcanac Metal Augur, Vulcan Blitz, etc. and also expreading electric procs, plus more with influence, grouping enemies with melee vortex, etc. I'll be focusing on the dagger interaction today since it is by far the easiest to use with good performance. This carryover trait only exists for full a transformative exalteds of the only other being Titania. Curiously, while Titania can activate melee influence with Diwata, it does not spread procs. This is probably due to Diwata being some weird normal melee and arc melee hybrid on the back end code. Also, do keep in mind you have freedom of choice for companions, where I would normally recommend choosing between Dirga for the auto priming, which is probably more useful than Nautilus auto cordon grouping since you have access to Embrace. Alright, let's take a look at those builds. One very important thing to note is that Archon Shards from Sevagoth will carry full effects over to a Shadow. This is useful to note, but not important for the Dagger Claws build since this specific setup does not require any shards. However, I would recommend considering running Primed Animal Instinct due to how big of our hitbox and nuking potential is. Do you remember my ability nuke normal mode really wants two strength shards though? Most of today's build will be using Swift Momentum and Preparation Exilus. Every time your shadow spawns, be it manually from casting your 4 or because of his passive when you down, it is considered respawning and will trigger preparation for maximum energy pool. Therefore, bring it whenever you can. Swift momentum is chosen because dexterity arcanes on your weapons will not increase the combo duration of Sevagoth's claws while transformed. This is also recommended to reduce the windup on his massive heavy attack if you use it. 
Today's builds, though, will focus on light attacks unless otherwise noted, since it is a lot more fluid to use. We want enough range for Embrace to pull enemies in as needed, and while not mandatory, Embrace allows us to get enemies in one place if two spread, and the multi-hit allows us to activate melee influence with Electric Claws easily. Remember that Exalted Melees have 1.0 follow-through, so all enemies hit will retain full damage scaling. The rest is just survival utility, being equilibrium for always enough energy, and then health and adaptation, and Prime Sure Footed if you have it. Alternatively, I could recommend Rolling Guard to get rid of annoying status effects since going to Operator forces you back to normal mode first, necessitating a long animation to reactivate Shadow. Rolling Guard can also be handy for getting iframes if you activate the Death Tone passive when you down. Arcane Fury and Strike are used because his claws are slow and that some setups today skip a base damage mod for a better utility. Now, since this is a dagger setup, let's take a look at our dagger. While not actually needing to be used today, it doesn't hurt to have an actual dagger build if needed. This is a simple gas electric rumble jacks going full status. If you want to use this as an actual melee, I would recommend replacing Spoiled Strike with an attack speed mod. Note that nothing equipped under rumble jack carries over to claws except the arcane melee slot and the type of melee we're using, which is, of course, a dagger. This is accompanied by Arganac, using Amalgam Arganac Metal Longer so that all of the electric procs we spread with melee influence will also be able to armor strip in a 20 meter radius. Bonus points if enemies are close enough or embrace for cross-chaining hits for more DPS and strip too. For a claw dagger setup, I modded them like this. Note that melee influence HUD icon is not visible while in shadow mode. However, it will still activate. You can only see the timer in normal mode. The Prime Smite is extremely important today, since it triple dips the electric procs passed on through melee influence for 3.72 times more damage. Prime Reach makes it a lot easier to hit enemies since we default to 1.5 meters range otherwise, and Berserker Fury is easy to activate on kills since we still have Force Bleeds. I went all in on status chance since our only goal is to activate melee influence to spread electric procs without necessitating constant grouping. This is important because Embrace functions like Thero Strike being able to only pull in a small cone in front of us, whereas melee influence hits around us in a perfect 20 meter radius sphere as well as replicating statuses. You'll notice I do not have Organ Shatter equipped on the build at all. That was a personal choice since I could not find a way to fit it. Most of our tanking comes from peeling return spam with force slash procs and obscene amount of electric procs spread. Sacrificial Steel is still important because it allows to activate Arcane Fury and Strike as well as fully benefiting from even default crit damage. You could draw melee prowess or Voltaic Strike for Organ Shatter, but both result in a massive loss of spread electric procs and or less damage per electric proc. For the 2 hour steel pad setup I've designed this for, which is roughly level 300 to 500, depending on the node you start on, Organ Shatter was completely unnecessary. Remember that base damage mods come from Arcane Fury on your shadow. You also have the option to use a 12 times heavy against Acolytes, since we don't use heavies otherwise and you can build combo back up quickly with Embrace. For our first and alternative setup today, I also experimented with Jack Attack's Vulcan Blitz so that you don't have to. As shown in my recent video with Saren, yes, Vulcan Blitz's AoE carries over into melee influence taxi. However, due to claw mechanics, claw kills themselves will also proc Vulcan Blitz. Again, none of the mods on Jack Attack matter except actually equipping Vulcan Blitz and bringing melee influence. However, if you want a pure viral Jack Attack build similar to what I used on my Saren showcase a week ago, then this is it. Now, armor is an issue here, so for Vulcan Blitz to benefit properly, you'd have to bring two Emerald Shards on Sevagoth. This is part of the reason why I don't recommend doing this compared to the simple dagger setup. You're also forced to use Proton Snap on your claws, as there's no other way to get both Corrosive and Electric on claws as well. Electric is needed to activate influence. Corrosive needs to be spread to achieve 100% armor strip so that Vulcan Blitz can nuke properly. The Shadow's build is the exact same as before, and nothing changes. This build has issues for three reasons. One, you need to activate Proton Snap to convert Electric into Corrosive. This means you need to wall latch for 2 seconds to activate it, which can be really annoying. I would prefer if it was just like Arcane Arachne and occurred instantly upon wall latch instead of requiring to wait 2 seconds. Do note it grants flat status though, letting us approach 100%. 2. You cannot see the melee influence buffs and influence buff duration cannot be refreshed until it fully expires. Now if you convert all damage corrosive, this means you cannot reactivate melee influence. Therefore, you're stuck guessing and watching enemies around you for electric stun animations to know that when you reactivated melee influence freshly. Only then can you wall latch, so they can now spread corrosive procs so that melee influence can get the AoE nuke of Vulcan Blitz on full armor strip. 3. 
you are now spreading Corrosive procs instead of Electric procs, meaning you have no way to deal AoE damage except actually landing kills with claws to trigger Vulcan Blitz AoE Cascades. All in all, while it makes for a pretty showcase where an entire crowd can die with a single swing, it has way too much work and 200 IQ thinking to read the battlefield for Electric procs before converting to Corrosive, and all too easy to mess up on. I even downranked Proton Snap so that the buff duration would match when melee influence expires, but it was still uncomfortable. You'd basically proc influence and see AoE stun in 20 meters. Proc snap then whack rooms for death for 15 seconds, then reset. If I could actually see influence's timer on Sevagoth, this build would be significantly more usable instead of having to stare for electric procs and guessing if influence is at 2 seconds left on timer or just activated with 18 seconds left since it cannot refresh while active. The third tested setup is much more simple. This is a melee vortex setup and I wanted to show while it has some use, I don't consider itself that good. To get this setup, you just need a melee with vortex equip in the arcade slot, nothing else matters. Here was the example Nami Solo and Karnam build I showcased last week with the arcane. Nami Solo actually uses this arcane extremely well and I'd recommend checking the video at the top right on Nami Solo's a huge winner from this melee update, and that has to do with the fact that it has an amazing circular hitbox on the heavy attack, complete movement freedom, good scaling, as well as force proc slash, and multi-hits enabling many, many magnetic procs to activate vortex. Otherwise, there is one other change to be made on Sevagod himself. We're changing the Auron Exilus for the Shadow to Ready Steel, which drops from new Whispers in the Wall content, and Co-Action Drift. This applies twice on self-applied auras and grants plus 31 initial combo. For the Claws, this time we go pure magnetic on elements and slot Corrupt Charge with Killing Blow. This is primarily a heavy attack focused build, and the heavy attacks connect twice per swing, with the delay between the first two swings allowing more enemies to be pulled in as a result of melee vortex. I still consider heavy spam on Sevigal to be extremely clunky, and he already has access to Embrace. Therefore, while usable, I would not recommend using melee vortex setups with him. From our testing and showcase, melee influence is by far the best arcane to use with Sevagoth's Shadow. It grants both survivability via electricity proc CC in a 20 meters radius, as well as a way to chain inflict AoE DPS. Especially because it hits in a perfect sphere, and Embrace only hits enemies in one direction closer to you, letting you inflict a massive amount of electric procs in an AoE very quickly. Combined with 1.0 follow-through scaling Exalted Malins have, everything dies instantly while maintaining full mobility on the light attacks. You can also just plow forward melee through enemies and still have very strong performance by sheer virtue of influence constantly redirecting any electric procs around you. Hopefully, this makes Sevgoth's Shadow more comfortable to play for others as well as opening up slots on the frame for more utility, such as Zora maybe even Moda Signal so you can have better double jump further and higher. Cheers! If this is your first time watching, feel free to leave a like or better yet subscribe, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. 79.5% of you are not subscribed, I'm trying my best to get you new information out always as soon as possible. Like I've been doing with the Whispers in the Wall update, stick around if you want to see interesting memes and builds on a nearly daily basis, don't miss out on any of that do you? That'll be for this video, thank you all for watching and see you all next time.